ஹலோ சார் சார் ஆ அந்த பேஷண்ட் எழுபத்தி ரொம்ப சொல்லு சார் அந்த சின்ன பையன் ஆ அந்த பையன் ஹலோ ஹர்ஷா ஆமாம் சார் ஆ அவனுக்கு நார்மல் சார் சார் ஹர்ஷா இஸியா எஸ் சார் ஆங்கியா சார் என்ன சிவி எஸ் சார் வி கேன் சிவி ஓகே ஓகே ஆ எல்லாமே முடிச்சிட்டேன் சார் இருங்க நான் ஒரு ரிப்போர்ட் அனுப்பிச்சு so uh, have you let everybody in or uh... okay ore illa sir namela vandirukana room ku ore nimisham okay central ku maru seat test panni paaka report sir Hi, Dr. Rakesh Ji, Rakesh Ji, what's up? How are you? Harsha, I have uh, unmuted him. Sir. Are you are you putting it on Facebook also? My Facebook. Yeah, I'll start, sir, in two minutes. What is the time now? Seven fifty-seven. Another three minutes more, huh? Yes. ஒரு நாலஞ்சு தான் இங்க இருக்க எப்படி போகுது என்ன பண்ண போறோம் என்ன எப்படி ரிப்போர்ட் பண்ணும் என்ன பாக்கணும் எங்கெல்லாம் மிஸ் பண்ணுவோம் எப்படி நாங்கள் பிக்கப் பண்ணுவோம் மிஸ் 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 பண்ணக்கூடிய இடம் இன்னைக்கு ஒரு கேஸ் அமைச்சிருந்தேன் பிரெயின் குள்ள போய் ஒரு <laughs> 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 Yes, I'm going to actually classify the wards into mucor and non-mucor. In mucor, they are classified into COVID positive and non-COVID positive. Same thing we have also done. Yeah. 40 beds we have allocated for mucor. We have started a mucor ward. Mucor ward in the hospital itself. Other than the non-COVID and COVID mucor. In either way, the case is non-diabetic. No, no steroid use. No oxygen use. No. Parenting was normal with COVID. With the, oh my so, God. It doesn't matter. What is the actual predisposing factor? Why it has happened? Nothing. Nobody knows. In fact, shall we start? I, if you are ready. No, no, no. Uh, Harsha, we'll start, man. Okay, sir. Okay. So, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, as you know, Royal Pearl Hospital is dedicated to teaching and propagating knowledge. We mean academics, academics and academics, nothing else. 
So in this series, uh, we did a, a first series on uh, one case presentation on mucor mycosis post COVID. Uh, but <clears throat> the more important topic I felt was radiology in mucor mycosis. So basically what we do in our center is that we at Royal Pearl, now we have started a, a complete mucor ward containing 40 beds and separated into COVID positive and non-COVID positive mucor, uh, I mean, uh, cases. This is the kind of, you know, uh, numbers we are getting. But before doing any case, what I usually do is I have a team of people whom we discuss with in person. It's not that I do everything. So uh, one of the most important persons I discuss is with my radiologist. And uh, this gentleman is actually a very world-renowned radiologist. He's an interventional radiologist. In fact, we have done a lot of coilings of ICAs and so many things like that. And uh, I go to his center, and this is the center I'm in uh, right now, sitting in his uh, room, uh, the director's room. And uh, I discuss every case as to how to approach. So he gives me a lot of inputs on how to approach a case. So uh, in fact, I can say my planning is done by him. So um, he is none other than uh, the author of the uh, uh, sign, Ram Haran sign, and he is Baba Haran. And Dr. Bawaran doesn't need any introduction. He has got a fantastic uh, track record. Uh, he's invited. He's one of the uh, most sought after speakers nationally and internationally. Uh, he's done several webinars. In fact, today I got his uh, time. I pulled his time because I couldn't get his uh, date all these days. Like I tried on Sunday, then Monday. He didn't have dates because he was doing uh, continuously webinars. And uh, if you look at his center, it's like, you know, uh, it's like a, a temple jam packed with a lot of uh, uh, mucor cases right now and uh, without much ado let me um, put him uh, put you all over to Dr. Bawaran. Uh, we'll make it something like an interview uh, rather than just a monotonous lecture. Uh, uh, so after the lecture you can all ask questions. Uh, he will be ready to answer uh, your questions. So over to uh, Bawaran Ramalingam. Rajalingam, sorry. So uh, good evening everyone. Thanks uh, for the introduction. So, can I share my screen, Hashano? Yes, sir. Right. Uh, I hope I'm audible. Um, so good evening, everyone. Uh, thanks to Dr. Jani Gramanzar for a wonderful uh, introduction and uh, the opportunity to present uh, the cases. So for the last uh, three and a half to four weeks, we have been seeing a huge surge in, in the number of uh, rhino uh, orbito cerebral mycosis. And if, if you take uh, my cases, probably from 2007 to 2020, I would have seen approximately some 50 to 60 patients of uh, fungal sinusitis. But uh, in the last three and a half to four weeks, uh, we have actually seen close to 120 cases. So that's a huge number. And that itself is a, a, a outbreak as such it is considered. But, uh, in the last... Right, uh, so what, are this, what is the basic clinical spectrum? As you all know, uh, this is the most common thing is rhinocerebral mucor mycosis. We have pulmonary micro uh, mucors, cutaneous, gastrointestinal, disseminated, and isolated renal mucors. So we have seen isolated mucors in, in actually post-transplant, renal transplant patients. And uh, now we, have, we are seeing uh, cutaneous mucormycosis also. And we have got seven cases of pulmonary mucormycosis as well as aspergillosis after this COVID surge. So there is a huge spectrum which is opening up and actually uh, COVID has shifted the diagnostic thing. Even if there's going to be an infarct today, we are considering are we ruling out COVID in these cases. So a stroke patients, the first thing we are looking is it a, a, a COVID case? So the number of young strokes, less than 40 years, patients having strokes has increased significantly. Usually we see around two to three, three cases per month. Now we are seeing around two to three cases per week. So that's the number of cases. So we'll concentrate today only on the rhino orbito cerebral mucormycosis, only that particular entity. So we have three stages here. So infection to the nasal mucosa and sinuses, which is the first thing. So the first uh, lateral sinus wall, uh, lateral uh, nasal wall, and the uh, middle turbinate, that's where actually the first uh, common area where it lodges. 
Now, as we go through, it is going to be predominantly a case discussion sort of space where I'm going to show you around 35 to 40, 40 cases of different presentations, different progressions, different involvement, which uh, has been described very, very rarely in a few uh, textbooks before. Then comes the orbital involvement where they say orbital apex or superior orbital fissure syndrome. Now, cerebral involvement where it can spread to the ophthalmic art through the via the ophthalmic artery or the superior orbital fissure or the cribriform plate. Now, apart from all these things, this is standard description in textbooks, but what we have seen is completely a different one. We have seen something more. We have seen uh, uh, vascular involvements. We have seen cerebrovascular accidents, getting into the pterygoid, getting into the uh, pterygomaxillary fissure, pterygoid space, pterygoid wedge involvement, whatnot. I mean, this particular uh, uh, fungus is actually very, very lethal. So these are the basic laboratory investigations that you have. Tissue biopsy, which is gold standard, as you all know, a nasal endoscopy and a biopsy. Tissue swabs, again, uh, with 20%, 10 to 20% KOH, uh, where uh, it can be used, or they call it as fluorescent brightness, calcofluor is used. Culture becomes rarely positive, and molecular diagnosis is pretty expensive with beta uh, D-glucon. Right. Coming on to the classification of fungal sinusitis, we generally classify it as invasive fungal sinusitis or non-invasive. So it's nothing but the fungal hyphae, when it is picked up by the pathologist, in the mucosa, submucosa, bone, blood vessels of the paranasal sinuses, then we call it as invasive. Whereas absence of hyphae uh, within the mucosal and other tissues of the paranasal sinuses is called non-invasive fungal sinusitis. Again, there is a lot of classification <clears throat> regarding this thing, acute, chronic, and chronic granulomatous. Today, we had a young girl uh, who had a chronic uh, right-sided pain. She had COVID last uh, year. 2020 August, but today she came with fullness and she had pain for quite long and that was a chronic fungal sinusitis, which I'll show you one case of that also, which has been operated. So which investigations to use coming out of the radiological part? Both CT and MR uh, can be used, but MR is always better in delineation of the intracranial extension. Now, before we were saying that bone cannot be picked up with, with MR. But today, with all the available and fast uh, high-end machines, we are able to pick up the bony destructions, the skull-based destructions, the pterygoid based destructions, zygomatic destructions, whatnot. Everything can be picked up with MR itself. But sometimes when it comes to a 3D planning, a CT is needed in, in some of the cases. But what is the role of radiologist here? Now, the diagnosis of uh, <clears throat> fungal sinusitis is quite straightforward because uh, as any ENT surgeon, you're going to put in a scope and say there is an SCA, there black, black discoloration, there is a devitalized middle tub in it. And your diagnosis is straight obvious in yours. But what is my role? You're going to send it as. As my role, I have to establish the diagnosis, number one. And I have to say where all is the destruction and where all it has gone through and how is going to be your approach. Because when there is one part that can be left, even if a small part which is left, that can lead to progression in the post-operative period. So these are important things. So we have to look out for bony destructions, soft tissue involvement, intracranial involvement, sinus imaging, whether, whether it's any other uh, fluid levels, what is the OM, uh, osteomatal unit, and how was the contrast uh, enhancement with the middle turbinate, and how was the cavernous sinus? So these are the most common thing that I would like to see, see because the diagnosis is straightforward in front of my eyes. So let's, uh, without wasting time, uh, this will be a completely a case-based discussion. I'm not going to put any words from now on for the next 35 cases. So uh, this is uh, just to show you a CT imaging, right? Uh, let me take the pen. <clears throat> yeah. See, this is a, a classical example. You see filling of the sinuses. This is classical filling of the sinuses, and you could see the hyperdensities. Now, in CT, the hyperdensities can happen due to fungal, can be due to hemorrhage if there's going to be trauma, or it can be due to chronic inspissated proteinaceous mucous material. These are the three entities that will give you uh, hyperdensity. That is, what is hyperdensity is nothing but you always compare it with the brain. Simple. What is the word hyperdensity? Always compare it with the adjacent brain or compare it with the orbital muscles. It's very simple. There are two comparisons here. So when you have the sinuses, when the sinus density here, well, let's say let's say that there is a hypodensity here, 
this is almost equal to the brain or uh, the uh, orbital muscles. Whereas when there is a hyper density or when you see the brightness of the structure more than that of the adjacent brain which you're looking at or the orbital muscle, you call it hyper dense lesions. So these are very classical and you could see here that the medial orbital wall is not uh, complete and there is an irregularity and there is an erosion in this case, right? There can be something sometimes like this. There can be an inspissated mucus and uh, there can be uh, calcification sometimes. This happens due to clogging of the virus and uh, clogging of the uh, fungus. And this can also be a finding in chronic granulomatous or a chronic fungal sinusitis, right? Again, you could see, I will compare it. Suppose let's say I've given you only the axial, axial sections. Now, where should I compare? Now, this is a hyperdensity compared with the adjacent pterygoid muscle, simple. Compare it with some muscle adjacent to you, compare it with the pterygoid or compare it with the brain structures. That's what you call it as hyperdense or hypodense. Actually, the description should be hypodense to the muscle or hyperdense to the muscle, but we have been used to saying hyperdensities. So always compare it with the muscles. Right. So this is another case uh, where you could see there is again, as I said, hyperdensity is definitely there compared it with the brain. Definitely the density is more. But what else you're seeing? See, there is a, a structure here. There is filling of the ethmoid sinus and you could see there is erosion of the floor of the skull base. You could see here that there is a subtle erosion here. The bone is completely eroded and it is trying to get it. Again, this is a case where there is a mucosal hyperdensity on CT. Again, there is a mucosal hyperdensity where you can see uh, the fungal sinusitis. Do I have to use contrast with CT? Now, see, when the patient comes, sometimes uh, is associated, comes with a history of seizures when the fungus has invented the brain or the patient is disoriented due to, let's say, a fungal cerebral abscess or due to an encephalomyelitis, which is a fungal origin, which is very, very lethal. It is very difficult unless and, unless and otherwise you sedate the patient inside uh, the MRI room. Otherwise, what you can do is just do a CT with contrast. So that is where actually CT comes into role most of the times. So most of the times when the patient is non-affordable, let's say the patient doesn't have that much, let's say a 10,000 rupees for a CT, we charge around 10,000 for MRI brain, MRI PNS, including the orbit and contrast. So total cost comes around 10,000 rupees. So when the patient doesn't have uh, that particular uh, cost with them and they want a CT, then okay, it is done. But for the surgeons, it's always better. MRI will give you a lots and lot of more details about the soft tissue involvement in the retromaxillary region as well as orbit and the brain. But when the patient is, let's say, very uh, agitated or when the patient is irritated, very difficult to sedate the patient inside the MR room, CT is very quick and you can access it very quickly. Now, again, there is, this is another case where you could see the sphenoid sinus is involved and there is an erosion which is getting into the cavernous sinus part. So this is a soft tissue which is entering into the cavernous sinus. Again, you could see the uh, there's a fungal sinusitis as I said, again, compare it with the brain. It's definitely high dense. So it's the hyperdensity. And you could see the septum is eroded. This is another case uh, where you could see sphenoid. So we were, we, we were telling that metal turbinate is the primary uh, source where it comes and lodges first and it spreads to the other organ. So this is a case where the middle turbinate was normal and there was no involvement of the ethmoid or the uh, maxillary sinus but there was involvement of the sphenoid sinus here. And you could see there is an erosion of the lateral wall of the sphenoid and it has gone into the medial temporal lobe. Here you could see that it has involved the cavernous sinus. Yes, I'm operating tomorrow. So it's a cavernous sinus and you could see this is a cavernous sinus involvement. So this is again a sphenoid sinus involvement and it's getting into the brain. So this uh, imaging can be done. So again, this patient was uh, not affordable and he had a lot of... Uh, uh, agitations and uh, irritability. So we had to take up and do an MR uh, or a CT here. So the same case where you could see that the sphenoid sinus and you could see here the pterygoid region is eroded. That's the pterygoid region. There should be a bone there which is eroded and the tumor is and the lesion is getting into the pterygoid space. So these are the information that we need to give you. So again, you could see the sphenoid sinus here look at here the intracerebral invasion extradural intracerebral invasion here and you could see there is erosion of the sphenoid wing here so sphenoid wing erosion is again one more finding associated with uh, 
fungal sinusitis. Now, anywhere it can erode. Right. This is the same case where you could see there is a lesion which is also entering into the pterygomaxillary fissure. So this is like some, something like a JNA which we see. So here initially you saw it was getting into the brain, it was getting uh, into the pterygoid space here, and here it is also getting into the pterygomaxillary fissure here. So here you could see the filling of the sinus. So now this is the angiographic phase which we did for this particular case because it was getting into the uh, pterygomaxillary fissure on plain CT and it also getting into the pterygoid space. So this is the internal maxillary artery. Now, this is called an angioinvasive fungus. So there can be thrombus of the internal maxillary artery. Now, I have to tell to my surgeon to which level the thrombus is there. If at all, there is going to be an invasion of the pterygoid and the pterygomaxillary fissure. Where does the thrombus end? Sometimes it may come up to here. There can be invasion. So I have to tell him probably this is the level that the thrombus is extending. So you'll have to clip it and ligate it much earlier and remove this entire part because even if this part of, uh, if there is a fungus here and it's been left within the arteries, still it can invade to the soft tissue. I just want to uh, add, I'm Janik Ram again. Just want to add that this patient I saw just today evening. The, the reason why I am uh, just interfering here is because you see, this patient is operated elsewhere. You can see that they have removed this part of the fungus and left behind the fungus here in the orbital apex, the pterygomaxillary fissure. You can see that the surgery has been done. And if you do something like this, an improper surgery, then the patient will not stand a chance of survival. So here comes uh, one more question. And uh, there is a common question from the surgeons. Uh, I have operated on this patient. Now, when do I have to do a repeat CT or a repeat imaging? Now, uh, when you do an MR and uh, when you do a surgery and when you have done a complete surgery, there's complete devitalization and they say, when you see a uh, uh, normal bleeding tissue, that's the end point of the fungal surgery, they say. And the surgeon is pretty confident. When you do a early imaging or repeat imaging, all the inflammatory tissues generally enhance. So it is not advisable to do uh, a repeat CT if that's going to be, the patient is doing clinically fine till uh, up to 14 to 15 days. But See, today there was another case where uh, the patient presented, was operated elsewhere, and the, within 48 hours, patient developed blindness of one of the eye. So in that case, yes, we'll have to do a repeat CT to find out where the uh, residue is and how it has spread and what more surgery it has to be done. So before surgery, it's very important to evaluate these small, small, small details. And these details, if there's going to be a small tumor, it will be hardly, let's say, some uh, eight millimeter or nine millimeter fungus, which is left, but within two, three days, it can easily progress because that devitalization just goes on and on. So uh, here you could see um, the same case. I've done an angiographic phase. So this is the right uh, internal maxillary artery here, which goes up to the pterygoid wedge into it. And here you could see this, that here there is a, from here, the internal maxillary artery is not visualized. And within this pterygomaxillary fissure, also the internal maxillary artery is not visualized. So definitely at this point of the sphenoid wing, there is a occlusion. So the tube, the, the resection now has to go up to the sphenoid wing. So that is the small, small details that is important because this is a deadly disease. If you don't do a complete surgery, you're going to land up in trouble. The patient also is going to land up in trouble. So this is another case where you could see there is an ethmoid involvement and the lesion has gone to the orbit. So complete orbital involvement. You could see the superior, uh, superior rectus here and the optic nerve, which is involved in this case. This is another case, again, CT, where you could see the medial orbital wall is eroded and you could see the abscess forming here. So this is the fungal abscess, which is getting into, and you, you can see the thickening of the medial uh, rectus muscle here. The same case where you could see in coronal, you see much, much better. And you could see that there is a complete involvement. See the ethmoid is involved and you could see uh, it's getting into it. Now, when the lesion is hyperdense, when the lesion is hyperdense, that is much brighter than the uh, brain on CT, many of the times contrast will not help. Remember contrast will not help. The contrast is done in CT when you have a, a fungal sinusitis is to assess the vessels in one case, either the uh, internal maxillary artery evaluation or when there is phenoid sinus involvement and going into the cavernous sinus, 
then you will have to look for the cavernous sinus enhancement and you will have to look for the ICA involvement if there is an ICA encasement, whether ICA is completely thrombosed or not. So this is the place where you use a contrast, right? So this is chronic, uh, again, this is completely chronic. Uh, oh, an old case of mine here, you could see that there is a comp uh, almost a uh, polyposis here, and you could see hyperdense lesions, hyperdensities here. This is another case where there was a subtle erosion uh, in the zygomatic arch, and you could see there is one more case where the premaxillary space is involved. Now, this detailing is also very important. Now, when, when you give only a mucosal uh, uh, involvement of the sinus and goes to the pterygoid, and when, when the surgeon prefers, okay, there is nothing else, and there's going to be, we are going to remove only this particular part, and if they leave around this or this, that's going to be problematic. Now, this has to be completely removed. So these are all details that uh, we have to be very, very sure and be discussed with the uh, radiologist. Again, you could see the filling of the sinuses here. Again, it's going into the posterior uh, coina here and filling of the sinus areas of hyperdensities. Now, this is a case where uh, it was a young girl previously uh, ha had COVID last year and just presented with a chronic fungal sinusitis. Right. Okay, before that, we'll stop. We'll stop there. Harsha, yeah, so let me ask a few questions. Let us make it very interactive. So, Dr. Bavaram, sir, uh, there are two things I want to ask you. Uh, all the cases you showed were mucor, is it? Yes. Okay. So, uh, in mucor mycosis, let us summarize. What is the role of CT scan? Do we have to take a CT scan uh, or CT scan with contrast in all cases along with MRI? This is point number one. Number two is... Uh, can MRI pick up osteomyelitis of uh, or dead bone? Uh, uh, these are the two questions I want to ask you. Okay. Number one, uh, yes, MR can pick up. That's the only thing. That, that's what I was very clear. And uh, MR actually can pick up uh, the uh, osteomyelitis and dead bones. Number one, MR is much, much uh, superior to it. Again, as I told you, CT is indicated, um, uh, CT can be done in all cases. Not, not, it's not wrong. And the radiation today is very, very less. Let's be very sure about it. CT is done in cases where if the patient is not cooperative for MR. So in those cases, yes, CT will be useful. Number two, for you to plan the navigation. Sometimes you plan only face because there is no other involvement, only sinus involvement. Suppose if you are planning a face and you, you want a 3D or, or a navigation protocol, CT will definitely help uh, in assessing that. But today, I think with the, the latest thing, you have... Uh, MR, which is also used for 3D navigation also, because in our center, we do uh, MR at about 0.6 millimeter sections for a contrast, 0.6 millimeter, which is the same as what the CT cut sections are today. And we get around 300 images uh, where you can stack it and you can use it for a 3D. See, suppose when you have a doubt of uh, subtle erosions and in all these subtle erosion, MRI plays a definite superior role than, than CT in all cases. So, so uh, in one case, you showed a little skull base erosion near the cripiform yes. plate. Uh, see, it is so clear. We know that the bone is gone and we have, uh, will this amount of clarity, yes. uh, uh, I mean, be visible in the MRI? Yeah, see, if you put contrast, this inflammation actually in the dura will be there and that will be picked up easily. So that focal dura can be uh, useful. But as I say, you, you, I mean, your eyes are trained to CT more than MR. Right? Yeah. So yeah. say as a, as a uh, ENT surgeon, you don't require a radiologist to come and tell you that there is a sinusitis, sinonacyl polyposis. In all cases, just see the film coronal images and you pick up and you know how to go about it. It's very simple. Initially, you start up with JNA, we had difficulty, but over a period of time, you know, I mean, I, I mean, you, you are well versed with that. So it's, it's like seeing again and again where you get used to uh, these things. MR definitely has a superior role. There's, there's no about, doubt about it. And uh, CT, subtle cases where you, you will not, where you are not able to do the MR in a hyperirritable patient, number one. Number two, uh, we want to do a follow-up. And when there is a subtle erosion, when the radiologists have a doubt, uh, don't hesitate to put a CT there. So there are two questions, one by Dr. Rajesh Shanmugam. How early you can pick up uh, mucor in a CT? See, whenever there is a hyperdensity on CT, the first thing that I will uh, think about is a, a fungal infection. So that fungal can be either chronic or benign. See, chronic or acute. Now, how to say acute invasive fungal sinusitis is just by erosions and extensions. Okay. Okay. Now, the second question is by Amulya Totam Bailey. Uh, she's from Bangalore. 
uh, sir, in how many cases of pulmonary mucormycosis along with rhino orbital mucormycosis have you seen? Uh, uh, should you do HRCT chest in post COVID rhino cerebral mucormycosis? Uh, see, uh, in all cases, it's not necessary. Whenever the patient complains of symptoms, let's say when the patient also has a chest tightness or when he has a hemoptysis or continuous cough, uh, then you need to do a CT chest in all those cases. Yes, we need to do. And we have picked up till now seven cases of fungal lung infections. So in all these seven uh, infections, how we were so confident was that in all these cases, we got the previous CT done elsewhere, which was done elsewhere about, let's say, uh, seven days or 10 days prior or 15 days prior when they were admitted for COVID. And we got it and we saw there was no cavity lesions in that. And when we actually reviewed this particular case, cases, and there were cavitating lesions, reverse halosine, and that's a different topic altogether, which I have not included here. But uh, we have a reverse halosine and we have a cavitating lesion consolidation where there will be angioinvasive fungus in there. So when we see that and when we compare with the previous CT, definitely. But certain characteristics of fungal uh, lung infections are, are very, very, very uh, uh, clear in that. Okay. So we will proceed on to the most wanted uh, uh, part. That's the MRI. Thank you, Dr. Bauran, sir. Uh, wait. Uh, Harsha? No, no, sir. I have to reach. Yeah. Are you getting the screen, Harsha? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, now, uh, the more important topic and um, of MR. Why, why MR and uh, how? what are we going to pick up? And we are going to see a series of uh, cases. Uh, the diagnosis, which I think everybody uh, which you see the images can pick up. But there are subtleties which we need to look into. Now, uh, with the what are the four important sequences for uh, the surgeons today? And I will add one more from it. But let's say all four uh, has been given as coronal images for you. Now, now, this is T1. This is T2. This is T2 fat sat. And this is T1 post contrast. Now, how do you identify T1, T2? And that was uh, specifically asked by Dr. Janagram actually to show why how do you identify now in t1 as you all know the fluid appears dark fluid is always dark right fluid is dark number one that's the first point in t2 the fluids are always bright right let's be very clear about it in t1 the gray matter is gray white matter is white this is an anat you easy to remember is that it is an anatomical image this is an anatomical image where gray matter is gray white matter is white fat appears bright. So this is the fat which is bright here, right? Now this is, I told you T1 and this I told you T1 FS post contrast. Now what is the difference here? This is FS because the fat is suppressed. You could see here, the fat is seen, right? You could see this fat is bright, whereas here the fat is dark. So this is T1, this is T1, right? So this is T1 FS, this is nothing but you suppress the fat. You say, I don't want to see the fat. Simple. And you give contrast here. Why that? All the particular pathologies can be picked up very well. And here you could see this is the gray matter, which is gray and white matter is white. This is called the anatomical image. This is called the anatomical image. Whereas T2 and T2FS or T2 uh, thing, which we use for pathological images, where it is reversed, the gray matter is white and the white matter is gray. Simple. It's reversed fluid is bright. Why this is T1 FS? Again, you could see the fat is suppressed. So this is T2 and this is again T2 where the gray matter is white, white matter is gray, but fat is suppressed. So we call it as T2 FS. We, from in which sequence you use contrast is always in T1. You have T2 contrasts, but T1 is the, you have T2 contrast, which is quite expensive and associated with, they have, we have to use iron. Now, uh, there is a lot of speculation saying is iron and ferritin the cause for uh, myocormycosis. Now we have seen so many cases, uh, for example, close to 100, 120 cases, but literally we have not picked up any particular reason. There are non-diabetics, there are non-renal failures, no steroid use, no uh, uh, oxygen use. The patient was at home, uh, he was qu home quarantined and he developed a lot of things. So there was no particular, and there, there were cases where everything was normal and we even checked back the ferritin and uh, IL-6 levels, which were done on day 8 and day 9 of COVID, which was also normal. Now, we were unable to point out where uh, exactly we have to find the reason is. 
So T1FS is where we use the contrast. Remember, that's the most common contrast which is available. T2 contrast is done only for liver. Don't worry about it, just leave it. Where do you use contrast? It's T1 fat suppressed image where you use the contrast. Images. We use gadolinium and there are uh, different generations of gadolinium. What we use is the latest uh, second generation, which is, uh, uh, which is as uh, safe as drinking water. Right. Now let's go into the findings. Uh, slowly, let's get into the complications here. Now, uh, as you all know, uh, what is this sequence? It's, it's simple, gray matrix, white. You could see the white matter here, which is gray. So we, the sequence is T1 or T2. T2. Yeah, this is absolutely the right. So you can tell it to yourself, this is T2. Here, here the gray matrix, T2. Yes, here, so this is again, white That's matrix, it. gray, and this is a gray matrix, white. So it's reversed. So still it is T, T2. But what is the difference between these two is the fat is suppressed. So this is T2FS, right? Okay, right. Now T2FS, right? Here you could see that's the mucosal thickening. The mucosal thickening in all allergic, bacterial, and acute fungal sinusitis is always bright on T2. Let's take it. It's always bright on T2. When there is a fungal overlay, it's always hypo intense. You call it as here intensity. Uh, now again, um, where do I have to compare? You always compare it with the gray matter again. Here you, there you compare it to the brain as such, the CT. Here you compare it with the gray matter. So, or you can see that's a gray and white junction here. You can compare. So this is definitely darker than the mucosal thickening. If you take a look very closely, there is a, again another uh, hypo intensity which is going to the middle turbinate. Are you able to see that? That's a classic middle turbin turbinate involvement. In, yeah, this is the in turbinate involvement. This is classical middle turbinate, uh, in turbinate involvement here, where you could see here, right? Here you could see that's a mucosal thickening, and this is the hypo intensity which is going into the uh, maxillary sinus. Again, you could see the sphenoid is involved here, as well as the. This is straightforward. Now the diagnosis is done. So T2 hypo intensity. That's the most common thing. There can be any other thing. Sometimes when the proteinaceous secretions, long-standing uh, chronic uh, sinusitis. Fungal sinusitis can have varied appearance, but acute mucor always has a T2 hypo intensity involving the turbinates, right? Simple. Here also you could see that it is involving, it is hypo intense. So now you know this is T2 and this is T2 FS. Again, this is another case where you could see that there is a mucosal thickening here and absolutely uh, nothing is there. But there was a doubt here saying you could see that there is some uh, small hyphae which is actually developing here. So again, we said this could be a possibility. Again, this, this is a very early case. Now, what was the presentation in this case? This is a post-COVID recovered and he had severe pain, a doctor's relative. So the patient said, I had pain here. I want to rule out uh, fungal sinusitis. He just came running. So that's how this case was picked up. Otherwise, we would not have picked up this case till it has involved the uh, turbinate or obstructed or come, uh, come out. So again, this is another finding. This is an axial image. Uh, which I prefer also over to the coronal images. As surgeons, uh, uh, you're all uh, oriented to the coronal images, but axial images are very useful. See, you could see here, this is called, this is the pterygoid space you could see here. This is an inflammation going on here. So this is called the perisinus inflammation, which can happen in the retromaxillary region and also in the premaxillary region. Here you could see there is a chronic uh, sinusitis here which is actually showing a deposit over the wall. So again, any high point intensity should raise you the suspicion. Now, what are the other differential diagnosis for this? First is fungal. There can be hemosiderin deposit due to previous surgery. These are the two most important things that can be appearing hypo intense to uh, on MR. Right. Now, where is the finding? Now, this is again a case uh, we thought uh, everything was normal in the first look, right? Everything was normal. The patient is absolutely fine. We don't have any other thing. As we went into, uh, we evaluated. Now, this could have been easily missed on a coronal image because of the sections. It's not about, it shouldn't be. So here you could see that's a lateral sphenoid resist, left sphenoid resist here. And there is a mucosal thickening here. And you could see a high point intensity there. So this is a very subtle case. Now, these patients, now if they go and get operated now, the, the mor morbidity is absolutely, absolutely zero. Am I right? I said that, yeah. that is absolutely zero. Now, this is a post-contrast image. The same, you could see here, that's a high point density, which is not enhancing. The other mucosal thickening is enhancing, whereas here it's not enhancing. So these are 
subtle cases and these pa- this patients came with a issue of headache post covid mm. now this patient was referred not for picking up the sinusitis to look for any venous sinus thrombosis mm. now luckily we picked up this and this patient now when she goes in for a surgery she is a lady young lady and if she goes in for a surgery now debridement and all those morbidities can be easily avoided right now this is another case uh, as i told you the turbinate as i told you you could see here yeah. t1 t2 i think you can tell it in your mind by yourself gray matter is white white matter is gray so this is t2 fat is seen or not fat. no so this is fat sat now when you give a uh, contrast this okay. is how the contrast imaging appears now this area will not enhance so the mm-hmm. here here that this is because that particular uh, turbinate is actually devitalized it's devoid of blood supply and there is thrombogenic invasion of the fungus into the vascular vessels so that goes in for a devitalization so that's why it doesn't enhance so that is called as a black turbinate sign so that is called as a black turbinate sign whereas you could see the rest of the mucosal thickening can have peripheral enhancement right this is another case uh, again you could see here this is t1 t2 this is again t2 fat is not there so it's straight forward fat suppressed so where are the findings here here yeah. here 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 oh, bilateral so so many areas it's like bilateral uh, maxillary and as well as the uh, ethmoidal involvement here where else we are doing again when you do an axial see that it's getting into the mm-hmm. sphenoid here so it's like you can actually get a lot of details and you could see the right sphenoid is also harboring a high point density here so these are subtle is when when this area when it is reported uh, or misdone reporting mm-hmm. now when surgeon feels only left is involved and he goes and clears the entire thing the patient may land up with a right facial uh, right orbital involvement or a cavernous sinus involvement in later date now these are important and uh, it's not like the textbook says yes it goes in the turbinate and from there it spreads not always there are, there are a lot of exceptions and and now with the covid era we are seeing only exceptions mm-hmm. in the most common cases right now again uh, there is another case uh, this is a post contrast uh, image t1 or t2 sir t1 yes this is t1 always contrast is given in t1 fat suppressed yeah. and you could see here and there is non enhancing devitalized tissue which is there again you could see here the turbinates are enhancing normally yeah there is absolutely normal turbinates but you could see only the ethmoids involved here mm-hmm. so these are uh, important uh, things th- that we are also picking up these days you should be careful about it right again another case post contrast mm-hmm. contrast plain yeah. it's a t1 post contrast image mm-hmm. no enhancement yeah. no enhancement so where does the fungus get enhancement from sometimes it they say in textbooks yes that can be you know, that's because of the peri fungal inflammation that still the blood is trying to come into the turbinates or the ethmoids or in the maxillary sinus and trying to reperfuse that particular area that area is actually hyperemic so that particular area will actually enhance but actually the turbinates won't enhance because it is devitalized right this is uh, another case which we did and you could see this is the frontal sinus which is showing the fungus straight forward right so hyper intensity but you see hypo intense areas what we picked up on axial images on brain you could see here that there is a small evolving abscess in the brain and there is also a disseminated abscess which is sitting in the frontal lobe so this is a post contrast imaging which shows enhancement here and this is the this is the uh, fungus which is sitting there and here you could see very carefully if you look at If you carefully look at this particular case see there is an ethmoid involvement that's fine but you could see there is a soft tissue extending into the extradural space mm. that's mm. that's something which we need to pick up now this can be missed sometimes on a ct now this is very important now a subtlety a very very subtle soft tissue which is entering into the brain slowly through the base of the skull mm. you could see here the same section but you are not seeing on t2 Mm. you're not seeing that on t2 if you have a closer look you're yeah. not seeing that on t2 right but when you give contrast you're able to pick up that's why on mr when you have suspicions when you want to look at the extensions you need to give contrast in these cases mm. right same case uh, where you could see the enhancement here that's a diffusion restriction 
uh, on uh, that because of the fungal abscess, which shows peripheral enhancement, the same case with multiple spectrums. Right. Again, uh, I think you can all diagnose this case T2, FS, or non FS, all three. No, all are T2, all are FS, axial coronal images. Diagnosis is quite obvious, right? Mm -hmm. Straight, straight here, and you could see the filling here. No, just a question, Dr. Bavaran. Uh, we talk about T2 Fiesta. And uh, oh, Fiesta, no, no, yeah. this is FS actually. For no, I just want to ask you what is the difference between no, that? Fiesta is completely the Fiesta is that uh, we do it for nerve imaging, yeah. We generally use it for nerve imaging in the uh, uh, systems when we have, let's say, a fifth nerve palsy or a seventh nerve palsy, you want to trace the third nerve, or when you want to trace the other nerves, then you use a uh, Fiesta. Fiesta is a sequence which is done very, very fast, like uh, you get about 300 images in a stack. Uh, let's say in about uh, a minute or so. It's very quick and you see all the nerve structures very clearly in that. And that is the, when you want to see the vascular loop when you want to do uh, this. So that's pre pre predominantly called as the nerve imaging. Now, and I just G want to ask you why I'm asking this is because we find that the V2 is almost always involved in uh, uh, mucus. So will Fiesta play a role in... No, no. See, if Fiesta plays... A, yeah, you can actually do... Even with contrasted images, actually, you can pick up oh. the particular uh, imaging. Fiesta is predominantly used for... Whenever V2 comes out of the skull base, mm -hmm. it's very difficult... Unless and unless you follow from the uh, cisterns out, mm -hmm. it's very difficult to pick up where the V2 is in the second uh, territory alone. So you'll have to do a skull base imaging, and from the basal cisterns, you'll have to follow the V2. So again, this is a straightforward case, uh, no orbital involvement, it's a very straightforward, uh, clear case. Now, this is another case, uh, again, you could see here, con this, the, again, you could see T2, yeah. classic. When you give black contrast with it, yeah, the, even in T2, it is black yeah. turbinate, but T1 post contrast definitely is not yeah, going yeah. to enhance. Yeah. Now, we, we thought, okay, this is the only thing, but you could see subtle inflammation of the orbital wall here. Mm -hmm. So when we gave, when, when we did thin sections, you could see here that there is an orbital inflammation. This is very, very subtle. You could see hardly two millimeter or three millimeter thickness soft tissue entering into the orbital. Mm -hmm. Now, when this is left again, this is going to cause yeah. complications later on. And here uh, it's very important. Now, this can be easily missed if you actually don't do a thin sections. Yeah. But these are very, very subtle, always compare it with the opposite side for symmetry. That is very important. Again, this is a case uh, where you could see here predominantly the premaxillary spaces are involved here. You could see. Yeah. And again, you could see the orbit. Orbit is definitely involved here, and there is a huge uh, inflammatory changes going on. All the orbital muscles are inflamed. And the, and the intraorbital fat is inflamed. And this patient had severe uh, eye pain and proptosis, and there was severe cutaneous mucormycosis here. And this is another uh, interesting case again. You could see here, this, this is classical mucor, right? This, is, yeah. this can be easily picked, easily picked, easily picked. Mm -hmm. But what else you're seeing? You could see that the inflammation is spreading here. Yeah. So yeah. now this tissue when it goes in for devitalizations and this fungus after surgery even if that's going to be a small osteomyelitis which is left back mm -hmm. this is a huge uh, growing ground yeah. for the fungus to grow so these are the informations that we'll have to get with mr again this is another case uh, where there was predominantly cutaneous it was blackish discoloration and complete cutaneous involvement here. Mm -hmm. complete cutaneous involvement which was happening there right this is another case where you could see uh, the classical fungus, right? You're able yeah. to pick up the fungus. Everybody will be able to pick up the fungus. Now, whenever you see a hyper hypodense or black thing within the hyper intense mucosa, you're going to suspect mucor in this present era. Mm. Here, you could see that it has gone to involve the alveolar process here. Mm. But these are important. See, this alveolar process, you could see here, the alveolar process is very clear on the mm. left side. Whereas on the right side, the alveolar process is involved. Mm. So when the alveolar surface is involved, definitely that also has to be given clearance because that can lead to future osteomyelitis here. Again, heart palate involvement can be picked up with an MR here. You could see definitely a heart palate involvement here. So when there was a clinical sign, you can easily say, yes, I saw the heart palate involvement putting a torch into this, uh, the uh, mouth. But here, I could see the heart palate involvement. So the heart palate involvement, the alveolar surface involvement, these are completely important and subtleties which are not given in all the textbooks for us to see these kind of cases. Fine. Now, this is another case, very young uh, guy. Um, this is a continuation of the same case. 
is a young guy 39 not diabetic non diabetic no renal failure no uh, alcohol no smoking not admitted in wards he no oxygen given he was at home a big shots guy you could see here yeah yeah yes very clear now this is clear for us now mm -hmm. we saw the heart palate involvement mm -hmm. and we saw the premaxillary involvement and we saw it was getting into the temporal fossa mm -hmm. and here you could see the peri sinus inflammation in the pterygoid mm -hmm. space mm -hmm. we could have just left the diagnosis here what else are we seeing any subtleties we are seeing there is something which is very here you could see thickening the of thickening of the muscles always compared with the opposite that is thickening of the muscles there is something bright pointing at us yeah there is something bright pointing at us. Vein. That is the superior ophthalmic vein. So here you don't see the superior ophthalmic vein, mm. but as here we see something which is bright. So when we when I see a superior ophthalmic vein dilated more than three millimeter sitting there, first thing that only thing that struck, strikes me is yeah. a cavernous sinus thrombosis. That's the first thing that 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 will strike me. Now there is so much involvement, right? and everybody can be biased and say, okay, fine, I've done the diagnosis, I've done the extension. Now the extension is not complete. Till you do the brain. Mm. So, as a protocol, as a protocol in Myocar, when you do a PNS, always do brain. Mm. When you do a contrast, cover the brain. It is easy. The contrast mm. coverage today, when you use a neck and a brain array coil, beautiful images, as I told you, there will not be very old images what you get. The beautiful stack of images you will get from top. To, you could see here the T2. I mean, I'm mm. using the same coil here. Yeah. From the here to the mandible, so clear. The previous mm -hmm. error is not possible. But you could see here, the superior ophthalmic vein was dilated. In all the mucor, brain imaging is important. Mm -hmm. Diffusion and flare is important. There are two, two sequences you cannot miss doing when you're doing a PNS imaging for mucor mycosis. And if a radiologist picks up a mucor mycosis, a brain imaging, at least with diffusion and with flare images are important, number one. Number two, when you have to give contrast, for the PNS, do not cover the PNS alone. Cover the MR because you are for cover the brain. You are for surprises. Let me show you the surprises which we got later. And this brightness is due to a benign temporal arachnoidosis. Don't worry about it. But this is what I was worried about. Oh, fine. So what we did, we went and gave the contrast. But in T2 also, you could see that there was a hypo intensity yeah. there sitting on the cavernous sinus. So we went and gave contrast, and that was the projection of this particular lesion into the cavernous sinus here. So this has to be removed and this patient went in for a complete debridement. And here you could see the pterygoid space inflammation also very clearly, right? Yeah. You could see the thickening of the muscles here. You can always compare it with the opposite side. Yeah. This is another case where it's an old case where there was a complete involvement of the cavernous sinus. Mm -hmm. The tube fungus is completely invaded into the cavernous sinus, sinus right? Uh, this is again another case of uh, fungal sinusitis. Uh, I thought like, okay, it's a very mild case. Everything is fine. But the patient was having uh, some sort of uh, uh, sensory disturbance and uh, on the left arm, actually. He had a lot of uh, sensory disturbance on left arm and left hemi uh, body. A lot of sensory disturbance he was complaining. So we did the brain and there was something there in the medial temporal uh, lobe. Something there in the middle temporal lobe, and I thought, okay, fine, uh, there is one more invasion that we are going to look at. Here you could see that the pterygoid space is involved. I think everybody can see this pterygoid yeah, yeah, space. Yeah. Are you able to see there is a defective? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That particular uh, I just bone. want to add this uh, this case we operated yesterday night, and it was through the foramen ovale, ovale yes. going into the temporal lobe. I resected the V3 and also took a part of the temporal lobe through endoscope, completely removed. Yesterday night we did it. So this is the, see, that is the detailing that is important. Now, yeah. this, this was missed. Probably Perfect. you would have actually uh, yeah, yeah. taken Just only here, yeah, yeah. and the patient would have landed in a simple complication. Yeah. Now, that patient gave me a clue having a left-sided, mm. some sort of a hemisensory disturbance. He had, he had some patient present with seizures and all those things. But this erosion of the bone through the foramen ovale, this is particularly important. Even if you are not able to say it's a foramen ovale because the uh, destruction is white, Till at least is a middle granule fossa which is eroded. That is important from the point of view, right? These are subtleties. Again, you could see the T2 picked up that particular lesion mm -hmm. in the temporal lobe. So that was there again. But you will see that the cavernous sinus is completely free here. Yeah. You could see that's 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 the uh, V1, V3 part here, and you have the vessels here. So the cavernous sinus imaging can also be done very very clearly, right? This is another case, right? Let's say now why diffusion, why brain is important. Again, you could see. There is something sitting in the frontal lobe here. 
So this was picked up. This is again <clears throat> the T1 image. Uh, you could see here the sinusite is here, and here also it is filling up on both sides. You could see you asked me the previous question, yeah. right? So here you could see the cryptoform plate on both sides is eroded. Are you able to see the discontinuity here? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it, this can be done. See, this is nothing but when you see a CT, it's it's like staring in front of <laughs> yeah, you. Exactly. But MR actually you'll have to search. It's a little but difficult to <laughs> as you as you see more and more, yeah, it's yeah. like getting trained in your skull base, right? <laughs> you, go and, <laughs> you go and train. So see, you could see that the cryptoform plate is eroded here, and it's also eroded, and you could see the lesion is X. <clears throat> from yeah. now remember the diffusion uh, restriction we call it as brightness is always with in fact it's the most common thing but the second most common thing in this sort of cases is due to abscess so the abscess can have diffusion restriction leave alone the other there are so many differentials the two things which you have to remember when there is a bright signal on diffusion images two things in this era in fact abscess, abscess. the abscess can be anything leave alone. that can be two things that is important mm -hmm. <clears throat> Right. See, this is uh, uh, another case which we wanted to <clears throat> discuss. Very simple. We thought again. Uh, here you could see that hypo intensity, mm -hmm. hypo intensity here, and you could see that that there is involvement of this phenoid sinus here. Now, mm -hmm. this phenoid sinus uh, looks like most hyper intense here, mm -hmm. and you could miss that unless, and otherwise, you see this is an artifact. Mm -hmm. So here, where the axial section comes into play, so this also has to be to brighter during surgery. That's very important. Now, uh, we thought this was a simple case. Uh, we're happy that uh, Axel picked up this lesion and nothing more, uh, this thing. But still, uh, there was something which was striking me in this case. I think uh, very difficult to pick up, actually. See here, in the temporal, uh, in the pterygoid, mm -hmm. the inflammation actually makes the muscle thick. Yeah. Whereas here is something rounded, which I'm seeing. So this is the middle pterygoid, lateral pterygoid plate. Mm -hmm. There's a middle pterygoid plate here. But there is something which is which has struck me here. There is something round, round structure. Usually, when there is a muscle inflammation, it's usually a diffuse muscle inflammation, mm. right? So we went ahead and said, uh, otherwise probably this contrast. Uh, I would have said, fine, uh, there is no other involvement. Shall we stop with contrast? But this particular finding made me go for a contrast again. Could see the abscess here. Yeah, that's a beautiful abscess. That's a peripherally enhancing abscess. Mm. Could you see only that? Yeah, you can also see the muscle. What is this? Look at that, skating into the brain, the brain. which was Extra not neural. seen on the previous images. So that is interesting. Again, this is eroding the sphenoid mm -hmm. and skating into the brain mm -hmm. here. Extra dural space into the mechanical scale. You could see here. This is what we were seeing in the previous image. Exactly. So this particular finding gave me a clue that there is something else which is going on here that could be an abscess. Let me concentrate there more. Mm -hmm. Did a thin section, mm -hmm. we were able to pick up that particular lesion. Otherwise, this lesion would have been missed. Absolutely, it is a easy to miss. It's not that uh, radiologists or anybody wants to miss, but sometimes when you don't have a suspicion, when you don't look into it very precisely and closely, sometimes you can uh, miss subtleties. But missing subtleties with fungal is detrimental. Yeah. Right? So again, this is a diffusion. Look at here. This patient came with a completely uh, highly disoriented state. We had to sedate him. Mm -hmm. And we the patient was came in ventilators and we had to do the MR with a long tube ventilator, actually. <clears throat> now you could see here, uh, there is a definite diffusion restriction. Now I told you this diffusion restriction can be due to two reasons. One is an infarct, acute abscess. infarct or an abscess. But mm -hmm. here, the previous case, when you see the abscess was clearly round, right? Yeah. All the abscess were clearly round, round and uh, peripherally enhancing. Mm -hmm. But here you could see that uh, this case actually had nothing round here. Mm -hmm. So this could be infarct. So the first, my uh, thing was, this is infarct. Mm -hmm. and we'll have to find out the cost, right? Again, you could see, look at yeah. the sinus involvement. Sinus <laughs> compared to the brain, the sinus involvement nothing. is nothing. Mm, nothing. So uh, when the previous teaching says the sinus has to be full and it mm. has to come, it has to go erode into the brain and stuff. Look at the brain involvement for any layman's eye. Look at the oh. brain involvement and look at, yeah, nothing. Uh, look at, look at it. Absolutely zero, mm. right? Uh, so it's something like that, right? So you could see here the sphenoid is involved, mm -hmm. fine. Edmoids are involved, fine. It's, it's all fine. And even the maxillary sinus has uh, a large some thing. But look at the amount of brain involvement in this case. Particularly, it's important. As I told you, I thought this was an infarct. So it, there's a huge infarct which is going on. 
because the skull base was absolutely intact in this case. But what surprised me was there was actually a subtle invasion here into the, into the lesion. And this had gone up and it has encased the right ACA completely. Look at that. Mm. The right ACA is thrombosed at this particular point. This is an MR angiogram, which can be done without a contrast. This requ doesn't require a contrast. You could see the right ACA is not there at all. So this is because the tumor has gone in and is invaded. This patient didn't survive. Okay. This patient didn't survive and did, we did an MR and in the next, I think in one and a half to two days, actually the patient uh, expired actually in this case. This is another case. Why I say again, MR is important in fungal sinusitis. You could see here, this was this was a case where there was involvement of the sphenoid sinus. Mm -hmm. And you could, you, this is the left ICA. Mm -hmm. This is the basilar artery. This is the left vertebral and this is the right vertebral. Where is the right ICA? Yeah. Completely gone. This gone. is because the petrous bone is completely eroded and it has caused. Look at it's a very subtle involvement of the brain because of the cross circulation. But the subtle infarct only there, but this fungus has completely invaded and caused thrombosis of the ICA here. Right. So this is a case again. We thought uh, this, this again. You could see pick up the fungus, right? I need not tell you. Yeah. I need not tell you about the fungus anymore. Uh, it's like quite obvious in front of you, but. What struck me again, you could see the left ICA here. You could see the right ICA. With your normal eyes, you can say, yes, that is, this vessel is slightly yeah. smaller. Yeah. Now, this is a patient who's about 45 years, right? This is an angio image. So that's why the image is a bit blurry because I want to have only the angio here. So it's like taking a portrait photograph where you want to have all the other areas blurry and you want certain things to stand in front of you so that you can reconstruct it beautifully. So here you could see, even to the layman's eyes, you can say, yes, this is large, this is small. Yeah. This is a 40-year-old guy who has uh, infection here. You could see from the ethmoid to the sphenoid, mm -hmm. he's definitely having an infection here. But why the ICA should be small? Mm -hmm. Right. When we did an ICA, we, we ne I never actually thought about this particular diagnosis. But here you could see uh, the ICA is definitely narrow. Yeah. ICA is completely narrow. And you can see, you can always compare it with the opposite side. Definitely mm -hmm. narrow. To my surprise, actually, we picked up an aneurysm in the MOC. This is very different. This is not due to fungal, but this was an associated finding which the patient was harboring. It was completely incidental. Now, these are uh, the complications. So, as I told you, when you do an imaging of uh, the PNS, what are the important steps you'll have to do? Now, you as, a, as surgeons and as the patient today coming with black discoloration, the diagnosis is in front of you. What is the role of radiologists here? Pick up the diagnosis, confirm the diagnosis. And in MR, do we have to do CT and MR? We've discussed it. MR is definitely far superior. But when you have subtleties, when you have subtleties, for example, a cribriform plate erosion or, 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 a, or, a, or when there is a subtle erosion of the bone somewhere, which are not clear with CT, MR, don't be hesitant to put a CT in those cases. Always do a screening CT. Again, the, uh, if you're talking about the radiation dose compared to what, it's very, very minimal. And uh, it, comparing to the uh, risks and benefits, definitely CT scores over in, in certain cases. As I told you, when there's a subtle bone erosion in the cribriform plate or when there's a medial orbital wall erosion, and when there is a subtle erosion of the sphenoid sinus wall, you may go and erode sometimes. You may not know, when, if you're not aware of the sphenoid sinus wall erosion, when you put a scope in, sometimes it goes into the cavernous sinus, then that can be detrimental too. So in those cases, it's always an important to actually look into every single aspect and whenever there is a subtle erosion, always look into it. And contrast, as I told you, uh, in CT, um, in few cases, yes, it is important. When you do a contrast in CT, make sure you do the angiographic phase in all cases. Anyway, you're going to give contrast to an angiographic phase always. Now, what is the role of radiologist? This comes. Now, bone erosion extensions. Mm -hmm. Where all it can go, which we saw, pterygoid yeah, maxillary fissure, pterygoid space, yeah, erosion of the pterygoid wedge and necrosis of the bone. Orbit, cavernous sinus, meckel space, premaxillary space, heart palate. Yeah. Brain imaging is very, very, very important. In all these cases, today, as it has a fungal sinusitis, brain imaging is absolutely important. What are the two sequences? You need diffusion and flare. Mm -hmm. And when you do a contrast, always cover it with cover uh, the PNS with brain. It's very easy to cover and you can get beautiful images. And MR angio uh, is non contrast. And if you suspect any vascular occlusion, or uh, as I showed you, any vasculitis due to fungal or fungal invasion of the wall, you have to do a MR angio in this case, which is absolutely risk-free and it is narrow. So this is the role of radiology. Now, subtleties with uh, 
certain things you can miss not a problem so for example when there is a malignancy you miss a small node and your surgeon is going to remove that particular node and come out but here when a small uh, area of fungus is left behind then that can uh, progress uh, as we saw in few cases so uh, thank you everyone for your patient listening yeah so uh, that is that is actually a brilliant lecture dr bowran sir uh, as usual uh, he always uh, freaks out whenever he he starts from the basics and then goes on to the uh, really high ended stuff now i have a lot of questions of course i will start the question session the first question i want to ask you is uh, what is your uh, protocol uh, when do you advise for a post operative mri uh, um, uh, usually in such fungal cases who have been operated okay suppose when the patient is completely fine does not show any uh, clinical worsening and the patient is actually improved actually you need not see the problem with mr is that after surgery after a surgery there is a lot of inflammation going on because you removed all the dead tissues and all the live tissues are trying to come and fill up that space and the blood circulation is so high and uh, blood circulation is so high and there's going to be a lot of hyperemia around now when you give contrast it's very 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 difficult i'll tell you it's nearly impossible to say where is the fungus and where is the inflammation because the fungus gets merged in the inflammation okay, fine but when the surgeon is sure when you're absolutely sure you've completely uh, done the devitalized tissue and you're finished and by seeing a bleeding normal tissue wait don't uh, jump to a repeat diagnose repeat imaging in all these cases usually wait it at least for 2 to 3 weeks that's what we discussed yeah. and still let me tell you uh, i'm not sure exactly whether what i'm saying is right or not for the 2 to 3 weeks also because this is a completely new entity Yeah. which is just taken us by a complete surprise, surprise. and uh, we'll have to wait and um, i think me i mean me and dr janigram actually we have discussed about it and we said let us do uh, a post operative imaging in affordable patients and we we'll looked at at a revised cost for post operative imaging days. after 14 after days 14. that's what at present we have decided and still we don't know whether that's right or not now we'll have to wait for another 2 months and we'll have to say okay this is 14 days we are we are seeing some problem and after let then probably we may either increase or decrease the time uh, as we uh, go on the same thing uh, initially when we started doing uh, JNAs. the jnas yeah. or the pituitary imaging <clears throat> pituitary imaging uh, surgeries then we generally do it because there at least it's very clear what you're doing is a tumor you do 36 hours post op yeah that's yeah. because the tumor all cases hands, all those cases yeah. but here at the at least we need to wait for because there's a lot of hyperemia yeah. let's wait and redo it but when we do a repeat uh, <clears throat> uh, imaging when do we do repeat imaging now when there is a surgery done when do you have to do repeat imaging is when the patient worsens or crp crp raises that's the two thing important so after surgery after 48 hours the crp has to drop yes. from the previous 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 level let's say the previous crp is 25 now it has to drop to at least 50% it has to drop if your surgery is complete yeah. so that is one thing that is important number two when the patient has a clinical progression for example the patient operated as we saw in one case where the patient was operated and the patient now actually developed uh, uh, let's say a left sided eye pain sudden eye pain or redness or when the patient suddenly has a visual loss or decrease in vision these needs to uh, evaluated immediately now which is the best investigation in all these cases it is going to be an mr so it 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 will be that and uh, ct is essential uh, for two instances because for the surgeons to see and also where all the surgery has been done and what are the area that is removed and what is to be uh, removed so for that cts so in all revision cases which you are going to do within a week and the patient has worsened always combine it with ct yeah so our protocol is whenever i send the, uh, our patients from royal pearl to dr bavaran we always take a ct along with an mri it's not just the mri but we do a ct with an mri so the second question i want to ask dr bavaran sir is that uh, see um, the, there is inflammation in the pterygoid muscles yeah. there's just inflammation in pterygoid muscles we may not find necrosis or abscess so um, Uh, we do not know there are some uh, situations there is a dilemma whether i have to open up the posterior wall of maxillary sinus or not yes uh, to open it up so now what i have been doing is i have formed a small surgical protocol which i'm going to discuss with them tomorrow i'm sorry about that but i just want to ask you that uh, if you can give me a, a vessel uh, mapping that is whether the internal maxillary artery is completely patent in every case 
then it would avoid uh, uh, surgical removal of the posterior wall. Is that okay? Uh, no, see, the problem is on, let's say, let's take this case. Let me share again. Okay. One sec. Uh... <laughs> Right. Let's mm. take this case now okay. here. See, mm. this case had uh, abscess here. Okay. And uh, the internal maxillary artery on CT was, was actually normal. We did we did the CT for this case also. Mm -hmm. And then that case actually, the angio is not there. Sorry for that. And mm. here, in this case, internal maxillary artery was seen up to here. Okay. It's absolutely normal here. Mm. So the internal maxillary artery may be involved only in cases where uh, it is getting into the pterygomaxillary fissure alone. Mm -hmm. So sometimes you, it these abscess sometimes will be there. Okay, leave alone abscess. Uh, we are seeing just hyperemic muscles in so many cases. Yes. Uh, uh, should we address that surgically? In whenever there is a erosion of the posterior wall, and whenever the contrast picks up any particular lesion there, erosion oh. and getting into, then that has to be addressed. Or else you yes. don't have to. You don't have to. See, this is a case again. Uh, this this here also you could see. Here, uh, here also you could see that the abscess is there. At the same time, you could see that that's a terigoid bridge yeah, here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That is, you can see the difference between this terigoid bridge. So definitely there is a darkening here. Yeah. So definitely there is an early fungal osteomyelitis which is going on there. That mm -hmm. also has to be removed there. Okay. So this can actually give us a lot of details here. Okay. So that is important. So I asked this question, Dr. Bauran, because there is a lot of uh, you know surgical removal of posterior wall of maxillary sinus. And uh, I felt that so many are unnecessary actually to explore the pterygopalatine fossa. So we should form some protocols of uh, surgery here. And now, uh, Dr. Harsha, can you uh, ask the questions which the participants have asked? And maybe some people can talk with Dr. Bauran straight away. Dr. Harsha, are you there? Sir, I'll uh, enable unmute option, sir. So... Yeah, you can have, a, uh, there are so many people whom I know uh, from various parts of the world. Uh, you can ask a few people to talk with Dr. Bauer and ask them, ask him their doubts. So I've enabled the unmute option. Anyone, anybody who wishes to speak can unmute and they can. But, but then everybody will start speaking, boss. You just uh, see yeah. who is raising their hand. Okay. Anybody Otherwise, has got any doubt? Otherwise, the chat there are. Ja, Janaki? Uh, hi, Agila Sami. Yeah, hi. Uh, very very yeah. good lecture. Very good lecture. Can you, can you to talk to Dr. Bauran? You can put your... Yes, uh, I, I, uh, the question is to uh, Dr. I, I Bauran. Can't see, I can't see you, man. No, no, because he's pinned, pinned me. He can hit. Huh? Uh, yeah. I didn't know. Wait, wait, wait. Uh, yeah. you can, uh, you now, can. now, yeah, we can see you. Yeah, come on. Uh, uh, my question is to Bauran, sir. Yeah. Hmm. Uh, hi, sir. Sir, good evening, sir. Good evening. Uh, just one question. Can you differentiate between mucor and uh, aspergillus in MR? Uh, because nowadays uh, I'm getting a lot of patients uh, uh, the, taking MR with fear, phobia, and uh, going to a uh, um, general physician or a uh, neurologist, uh, the uh, radiologist giving the report as mucor mycosis. And when I see the patients uh, on the table or, uh, or clinically itself, I know that it is only a uh, aspergillus ball, something like that. And uh, <laughs> they are very easily convincible for surgery being for the phone. Really yeah. <laughs> so the thing is, can you differentiate or not? Because uh, everybody is giving aspergillus as a mucor, mucor like that. No, sir. See, in chest, yeah, in chest, actually, you can say which, whether it is Aspergillus or mucor. Actually, aspergillus has particular thing. It has it is within the cavity. When it is intracavitary fungal ball, yes, you can say the most common thing is the aspergillus. In MR, rhinocer coming out to the rhinocerebral mucor mycosis, how do I report? Is it, I think he knows very well. I just give the word fungal invasive he sinusitis. Fungal I sinusitis. never say it is mucor, mucor yeah. because I'm not seeing mucor. I'm not a microscopic. I'm not. A, I don't do a staining there to see which which actually the fungus is. So the report I give is, is it, it is an invasive fungal sinusitis. That is important. Yes. Okay. In, in fact, it. yeah. In fact, three days back, uh, a patient uh, uh, was running from Nellut came to me because the radial has uh, given us early mucor mycosis that because it was confined in the in the <laughs> actually yes. sinus only. I think uh, as as, as, as only you, I, I know you for only. very long. I mean, uh, I'm 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 following you on Facebook and uh, <laughs> and I think we both follow each other in a lot of aspects. <laughs> I know, you know. For quite long. See, uh, you as you, you would have seen so many fungal sinusitis where actually they've removed and picked up uh, most commonly aspergillus in the previous era. 
ஒருத்தர் <laughs> 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 Yeah. Thank, thank you very much. There are many people to uh, ask questions, so I will yeah. say bye. Can, can, you, uh, can you just uh, show yourself any other person? You got time? No, 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 sir. I just want to switch on. I forgot to switch yeah. on. Uh, yeah, Dr. Prakash Munka has raised his hand. He's our very close friend from Bukaro Steel. Yeah. yeah. Can you please uh, come over and ask the question? I have... Yeah. Yeah, I... I have been following Dr. Baba Ran since long. Hi. and it was an elaborate lecture which uh, i have seen on this but nowadays like me and janki discussed few days back there is lot of mucor phobia and many of the patients who comes are not mucor but it's a simple sinusitis and most of the uh, type 2 ct or uh, they don't have a good mri available so we decided to go for ct i requested in ct what is the double shadow and how if you can show in some of the uh, city of yours how to differentiate it from a sinus inflammation and the mucor or the fungal infection yes sir i think you want you me to share been... again I, i i said the same thing before because when we had a discussion on ct uh, i said yeah. the same thing before now you have to always see two things sir in acute sinusitis usually there is a fluid level there that that yeah. a fluid level which is sitting and there is no erosion of the bone Mm-hmm. fungal sinusitis can be as i told you it can be chronic or acute in acute it can be invasive or non invasive but in uh, the point to dis- decide on uh, ct is that uh, there should be hyper dense area within the mucosal thickening that hyper density should be more than that of the adjacent muscles or or the brightness should be more than more than the adjacent muscles or the brain parenchyma that's why we call it as hyper density and that's a double shadow you're talking about because when there is a sinusitis yeah. super added mu- uh, fungal infection the fungal infection appear slightly darker uh, sorry, the mucosal thickening appear slightly darker compared to the fungus so it's the reverse in in ct the fungus appears bright in mr the fungus appears appears uh, low or it, it's dark that because mm-hmm. hemosiderin hemosiderin mm-hmm. uh, associations so that is the uh, how we would differentiate the invasive nature of the fungus can be picked up only with uh, the inflammation of uh, Uh, the orbital muscles or when there is erosion of the adjacent structures number 2 right and peri sinus inflammation as i tell you again see you we have seen so much of acute sinusitis bacterial sinusitis which has gone in for osteomyelitis later but mm-hmm. early acute sinusitis does not have peri sinus inflammation in the uh, pterygoid space or in the premaxillary space premaxillary space usually has for some people but pterygoid space involvement is very classical of uh, the fungal infection i think you made the point very clear and about the zone as dr janki just said whether to do go for dankers or not what are couple of important points one should look in mri to decide that uh, the disease is going into zone 2 or zone 3 or something like that uh, actually that we will discuss tomorrow sir tomorrow we have okay. a, a we will we'll not exhaust <laughs> right. everything today tomorrow yeah. with dr pavan singhal we have got a beautiful uh, lecture at 8 o'clock we will discuss how right. to go about in every zone we'll protocolize and we have a series of lectures on that we'll ask some questions okay, pertaining, just, pertaining to mri and uh, okay just one last question yeah. which texla up to which texla machine is good today i was talking to a radiologist he said my machine is 0.0 uh, 0.3 texla machine sir i cannot give you so what is is there any specification for the mri machine minimum what texla it should be sir uh, see uh, when there's going to be a low tesla machine it's like you know the old age uh, machine so it means that the quality will be slightly less and the subtle involvements you know to pick up the post contrast imaging which i said show you very very small details that mm-hmm. can be sometimes missed with um, the low tesla units but this was the one which we were using previously but mm-hmm. uh, if they can see the problem with low tesla unit they cannot apply a proper fat saturation images see the yeah, that is require fat saturation now fat oh. suppressing the fat is is uh, not possible in all machines which is less than 0.5 so you need at least oh. one tesla machine but what we 1.5 will be ideal you don't require three tesla because 
I generally don't see much of a clarity difference between 1.5 and 3 Tesla, though there is so much of hype, so much of cost difference. Mm -hmm. You require a 1.5, which is enough. And if some, but there are a few machines in India, which is about one Tesla, that is, that is applicable. But anything less than that, with fat suppression, it's very difficult to uh, pick up. Exactly. The same thing my radiologist told me today morning. Thank you very much, sir. You have replied. Thank you, Dr. Prakash ji. I Thank really you. appreciate your presence in all our webinars. Please Thank you, uh, sir. be there for tomorrow also at 8 o'clock. Huh? We are going to discuss yeah, sure, the protocols. Sure. Yeah. Any other person wants to ask some question, please, you can unmute yourself. You can show yourself. And uh, here is the dawn. <laughs> Basha of uh, radiology. Please, anybody wants to ask some question? Ahmad Hejam from Egypt. Oh, Hejam Fazi. Yeah, you can you can ask Dr. Fazi. Hello? Harsha? Sir, he's unmuted, but he's not speaking, sir. Okay, okay. Right. Anybody else? Dr. Harsha has raised their hands. Hello, sir. Good evening. I'm uh, Dr. Rangam Sethi from AP. Yeah. Hello, sir. Uh, am, I, am I audible, sir? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You're audible, sir. Please go ahead, sir. So, so today, uh, uh, nowadays, a lot of people are coming with, as you termed, uh, mucorphobia. So a lot of post-COVID patients are coming with uh, simple uh, or uh, little symptoms like fullness of face or some tingling sensation or mild pain like that. Do you do MRI for all the patients or do you do any other preliminary investigation apart from just doing a clinical examination? Because clinical examination was not relieving, revealing anything, but we have seen some uh, MRI where you had shown that the mm -hmm. even intracranial and pterygoids are involved without any nasal or sinus, uh, sinuses involvement. There, there was involvement, but it was very, very small Sorry. compared to that of the uh, intracranial component. So that is what uh, I was trying to say there. And uh, you see, I think uh, in our place, we get referrals. I mean, uh, it's like whenever the, pay, whenever the clinician suspects, it comes to. And when the surgeon sees it, first of all, there are so many phobias here. Even there are a lot of uh, surgeons who doesn't, uh, who are afraid to actually put in a nasal endoscope to see. Let us be very clear about it. And those patients actually, whenever, uh, when there's a post-COVID thing, when the physician sees them and they say, you do an MR and then go to the uh, ENT surgeon for doing a nasal endoscope if needed be. Otherwise, uh, that, that's how, it depends upon the uh, a clinician and surgeon rather so, than what so What does uh, Dr. Janaki sir uh, advise? Should I do MRI for all the patients who come to us? I, I always say, if you, uh, if you are seeing a patient post-COVID, post covid yeah. and if he has got uh, a headache i usually uh, do a ct scan and also if uh, and i treat him for maybe around uh, three or four days and then after that i go in for an mri but i use it as a screening a ct is just like a screening uh, because okay. uh, or else i mean if it's going to be a normal nasal endoscopy see today i had a case a patient had a, a mild headache a 20 days post covid a lady and uh, of course, um, she insisted on MRI. MRI was normal. So it's like, you know, we're going to, uh, you know, um, waste a lot of, uh, I'm sorry to say, a lot of money on, uh, uh, you know, an MRI. So many MRIs for nothing, but he's already got a queue for really deserving patients. So I think if you are finding a nasal endoscopy, which is, no, uh, which is normal and a very subtle symptom, then I think I would rather go in for a CT. And if you find nasal endoscopy normal, but you have uh, uh, symptoms like suggestive of numbness or specific symptoms of eye or maybe crusting, which is seen on endoscopy, something like that, then I would go in for an MRI. What is your take on that? Yeah, yeah. that's the same thing which, I'm, which I will also say. See, there was a case, uh, there was a doctor's uh, um, sister who suddenly a diabetic suddenly had uh, puffiness of the face. So he's a treating physician, of course. And he's a COVID physician. He wanted to come and uh, do an MRI. I said, you want to do MR, I want to do the sequence, I want to do again contrast. I said, let's wait, let me see what is what is going on. Then I said, see, this is a very simple sinusitis. There was air fluid levels, there was no fungus there. I said, I won't do a contrast there. I just screened the brain, there was nothing there. He said, no contrast, leave her alone, we'll follow it up. The patient went in for an after two days of antibiotics. Today, the patient went in for nasal endoscopy. I think the ENT surgeon cleared that there is no fungus. 
and we didn't do because of the phobia there. So see, these are things whenever the phobia and the patient wants to do an imaging uh, as a surgeon, as a doctor today, when we refuse a case doing an imaging or an investigation and when it comes later, then he might blame us. So yeah, that, yeah, is, that yeah. is where we... Exactly, exactly. Come. That's our work here That's as well. Problem occurs. So in those cases, uh, see, everything can be reversed. When you do too much of investigation, they're going to screw us. Again, when you don't do investigation also, they're going to screw us. Anywhere we are at the receiving end there. So uh, that, that's that's what. Yeah. So in these cases, what we do is, see, for example, when, when the radiologist sits and does an MR there and says, okay, this is straightforward uh, acute sinusitis. There's no fungal element. I won't do a contrast. You don't do a contrast. Do so a contrast. at least avoid a contrast. I mean, you can do just yeah. a plain MR, not yeah. a contrast. Yes, that's what I said. This is straightforward and I don't want to do it. There's no erosion. There's nothing. I don't see any fungal. Even as I told you, the earliest fungal which we saw was around 6 millimeters, which I showed yeah, you. Yeah. That was an absolute incident pickup. Yeah. Because the patient came in for a headache. So when we just screened the coronal, I saw something was there. He said, just pull it down and do the imaging. So that's where the radiologist sitting in front is important. And I, I sit on my consoles whenever CD, CD or MR is done. And it's not a tele-reporting sort. We have to sit in the console and the technician has to be trained to see what, what is happening. Even suppose when you've gone for lunch and there is a case going on, my technician will know, yes, there is something problem. He'll definitely take a photo and send me that there's something here. Do I have to do anything else? So that is what we have to teach technicians also here because they are also at uh, uh, there here. Many and I, one, more, one more thing I want to tell all the surgeons, I'm sure all of, the, all of you are surgeons, uh, this is the temple for me to learn. The Magnum Center is the temple for me to learn because every case I come here, I discuss with them and then only I go and operate. So this is something which I think everybody should have. Uh, uh, you cultivate that habit. Go to the radiology center, talk with your radiologist because he will give a lot of inputs, uh, uh, such, such areas involved. So our planning of surgery actually uh, will be finished off by uh, uh, the radiologist like Dr. Bavaran. So this is one carry-on message I want to tell. Yeah, this is a two-way learning. Many of the times from the radiologists, the radiologists are blind uh, in knowing uh, what the surgeon does in most of the world. So what is Denkers? Many of them doesn't see. Let, let me tell you. Otherwise, uh, it, 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 we are doing from head to toe there. All the even. So it's very difficult to know every single detail of surgery of what you're doing. Certain details, if you give inputs and you say, yes, I want to do a complete clearance. What are where it is going? Now I have done here. There are cases actually initially when we started our discussions, let's say uh, uh, 10 years now, 9 years before. Oh, no, 15 years back. Yes. Uh, so in those cases, 12, 12, 13, oh, yes, 2007, it's almost close to 14, 15 years. 15 now. years. So in those 15 years, it's not that I've not made mistakes. There are so many mistakes that I've done, and he has pointed out after surgery, uh, you didn't tell that. It's the other way too. So it's the other way too. I've, I've uh, <laughs> learned a lot of things, and over a period of time, you know, that helped. And me a more lot importantly, of after the surgery, it's better to show him the uh, video. Uh, show the radiologist, okay, this is what I've done. So maybe this is the part I've left behind. Can you concentrate on this part? These are things, you know, you can have a beautiful discussion. It's like a marriage uh, with your radiologist. A great thing. Dr. Babaharan, I think you will agree with me that when we put a requisition for an imaging, whatever it is, the clinician should give what exactly he is suspecting and what areas I am interested in. Just writing an MRI or CT, probably you will do the routine thing then if I see something and if I mention that this, 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 because many a time my radiologist has questioned me, ki, yes, you said about this area, this area is clear, what more you want? So I think that's a better strategy. Yes, that's always there. Whenever you have a complicated long surgery or, or a surgery like uh, for fungal where you're going to do so many areas, and so many areas. A debridement that you're going to do. I think in those cases, I think certain discussions. See, as now it has gone the past three, four weeks. Now he he's very clear. Dr. Janikram is very clear. He will just see the MR and he'll 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 go in for surgery. So he, he'll ask only if there's going to be subtle problems which he, he wants to uh, answer or clinically he sees something. Nowadays, I mean, he's got well versed with the MR also. So that's that's a kind sort of a marriage, as he said. No, I learn, uh, I give input. So that's how it is done. It's not we have Dr. Ahmed Hesham. Uh, yes. Hi, Dr. Ahmed. Hi, how are you? Thanks Where are you from? You're, you're from? I, I've, from Egypt, I'm, right? Yeah, I, you meet me in Oman. Yes, Boston. Oman, Oman. Yeah, yeah, I met you in Oman. Yeah. yeah. You got any questions to Dr. Bavaran, please? Uh, I'm asking about, the are there any indications for the orbital excentration based on the MRI findings? Yeah, that I have to answer. <laughs> I, I will be answering that tomorrow. We have a protocol-based uh, lecture 
on surgical yes. aspects. So that we will answer. Uh, okay. That's not an issue. You have any specific questions related to the MRI sequences? That's everything is clear with. Uh, so everything. nice. We will meet Thanks tomorrow at 8, 8 p.m. Uh, sure, inshallah. Sure. Thank you sure. so much. We have Thanks, Dr. Sir. Vidya Sagar. We have Vidya Sagar. He's a very, very famous surgeon, skull based surgeon uh, from uh, Hyderabad. Dr. Vidya, you can, yeah, you can show yourself. Hi, hi. Uh, hi, Dr. Banki. Very, very nice. Face, man. Let me see your handsome face. <laughs> hey. I'm not that handsome like you. <laughs> okay, yeah, tell me. Yeah, he's so, a, a very famous guy. Yes, sir. Yeah. Superb lecture. Really, really enjoyed your lecture. Thanks, Dr. Janaki, for arranging this. Uh, as we are all followers of Dr. Janaki and his team, we are also doing quite a bit of uh, invasive fungal sinus surgeries here. But right now, we are also seeing other variant. That is, there is a lot more of osteomyelitic variant. We don't, we don't see that much of SHR, but we see a lot of alveolar abscesses. And when we send it for histopathology, we don't see mucor, but the rest of the uh, clinical presentation, everything is so uh, similar to it. It's so acute in presentation. The way it spreads is also so quick and uh, it is also eroding um, the maxilla, the bone. And uh, we had to go ahead and uh, do a partial maxillectomy and we are sending them but we are not finding any uh, fungal elements there. So I just wanted to know your experience based on imaging. Is there a way to differentiate this variant from the invasive fungal variant that we see commonly? Oh, okay. uh, sorry for not adding that case. Uh, today uh, morning we had a case where the patient had a tooth pain and the patient had severe swelling and redness over one side of the face. So, uh, the patient was sent for an MR and uh, in MR actually we picked up a lot of uh, small, small, small locules of abscess and we picked up the alveolar inflammation. And I'll not be able to open that. Okay, if possible before the end of this next session, probably I'll open that and show you. See, there was a lot of abscess you, going on into um, the maxillary, pre-maxillary region. It was getting into the pterygoid space actually. Uh, we thought it was an acute... Um, bacterial osteomyelitis. The patient had pain for a thing. Again, uh, this patient actually did not have much of a sinus involvement or anything else. The patient had osteomyelitis of that particular uh, bone alone. So when we actually, when the surgeon actually today tapped and sent it for a K, which it was positive, we thought it was uh, acute on the reverse uh, way around. There is no way on imaging that you can say, uh, if there's going to be a destruction of the bone, there is no, if the bone is already destroyed, it is very difficult for us to say whether it is a bacterial or fungal sinusitis. But as I showed you one of the cases before, when I reopened that case also again, where you could see the non-enhancing hypo-intensity there sitting on the pterygoid wedge with the uh, ongoing fungal infection, you can definitely say that is an early fungal osteomyelitis. So the early fungal osteomyelitis of the pterygoid wedge or the pterygoid bone, or it's going to be a middle turbinate, which, which we saw so many cases, because of the devitalization this early osteomyelitis is nothing but the fungus has invaded into the bone, but it has not eroded the bone. What we see, the bacterial, they go in and erode, erode very quickly, whereas fungus actually gets in, goes into the from uh, vessel vascular part and then haversian canals, they block first before they go in for a rupture of that particular uh, uh, bone. So that non-enhancing high two intensity on, T, uh, on imaging, on T2, is classical of fungus, whereas all the other osteomyelitis, all the other osteomyelitis are always hyper intense on T2. It is always bright on T2. Whether it is eroded or not eroded, it's always bright. Whereas eroded fungal sinusitis, when the sinus has gone for erosion, fungus eroded, it will be hyper intense. But before erosion, the bone appears dark or very low uh, on the uh, post control which I, which I actually had showed you, that's an early sign saying that there is a fungal uh, infection there sitting. See, that always has to be compared with the opposite side because the bones appear darker on uh, MR. But when you give contrast, because of the vascularity around, there will be a subtle brightness going on into the particular area where there is a vascularity getting into because of 
this particular internal maxillary artery as well as the haversian canals there is a subtle hyperintensity but the uh, op always compared to the opposite side but when both bones are involved it's very difficult to see but when you when you have one particular bone involved the other is not involved you can see an early fungal osteomyelitis one yes. one thing is that uh, do you see a lot of sequestrum also in fungal no 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 see, we don't fungus, see that. fungal in bacteria see, we in, see a lot of chronic bacterial infection we see whereas yeah. in fungal only in chronic such erosions where the patient has underwent let's say a two three fessus where yeah. they have got operated again and again then the chronic osteomyelitis or the sphenoid bone or the pterygoid then you get a lot of sequestrum, sequestrum. so not that in, is not one thing which you can sensors. yeah not in acute so you have never seen sequestrum even though the bone has been osteomyelitic i, I am yet to find sequestrum in all my cases around 140 cases i've done and i have uh, which very rare to see sequestrum but in bacterial we have seen lot of cases with sequestrum Uh, front even in the early stages that is no, of course in later okay. stages in later okay. stages only but what i mean to say is this is too early and uh, we've never found uh, sequestrum in any of our cases right yeah yeah, yeah. let's wait let's wait and see because but uh, the type of uh, yeah so so we have to wait for all this to happen it's too early for us to say you know true yeah. true yeah. thank you so much one more just point or a comment that we find is the peri sinus inflammation whenever it is there what we find is the if there is no abscess and if the contrast pickup is there then the amphotericin works better better in those tissues and we don't have to debride so aggressively yeah. so there is one finding that we are uh, seeing that so muscle inflammation all muscle inflammation will enhance on mr yeah. all muscle enhancement is going to enhance with mr unless and otherwise you see a posterior wall erosion or as i showed you one of the case where the lesion itself went entering into the pterygo maxillary fissure so vidya sagar i have a beautiful presentation tomorrow tomorrow if you can join me at the join talk. definitely yeah because yeah, this is a very nice question you asked uh, what about muscle inflammation versus uh, you know the necrosis versus you know um, what do you do for that so we have a beautiful uh, i have some very small cues for that Uh, we will. Uh, we will share it tomorrow at eight o'clock. It will be great if you definitely can. Definitely, we'll be there. Yeah, I will be there definitely. And one more, one more small yeah. story sure, to sure, take. Sure, sure. Carry on, carry on. I, I, I still believe this hypothesis of thrombotic episode happening, which is super added by this mucor, which is a common soil that we see here. So, and that is having more of a posterior spread rather than anterior to posterior spread. posterior to anterior or post it's almost like a jna from the sphenopalatine foramen it is spreading like a fan that's how uh, we are seeing in more than this uh, 100 plus cases that we have seen absolutely true because uh, we have seen more cases going into the pterygoid and getting into the brain rather than directly as textbook says to the superior abdominal fissure so exactly so fissure extension we saw only three cases but other than that we have also seen five six cases which has gone to the pterygoid and has eroded through the foramen away into the brain so as you said but but i i i have a little different uh, <laughs> i have a little different uh, finding i may not be able to agree with you on this because we have carried out our uh, findings intra op uh, correlating with mr tomorrow I'll, i mean day after tomorrow i'm going to talk about that in on sunday i may not agree with you on that sphenopalatine artery because see i will tell you i i'll just open it up now what i do is uh, i'm sorry if i'm talking that so what <laughs> i see the uh, uh, pterygo maxillary fissure inflammation okay the first thing i do is uh, i do what is called the prick test i just prick the inferior turbinate to see how much of without any hypotension i just prick and see how much of blood is coming i'm going to discuss about that and then i go to the sphenopalatine artery and then i use the scissors to cut it and if it bleeds briskly then i feel the uh, and then i correlate it I correlated that intraoperatively by opening up the posterior wall. It was not involved, even though there was peri sinus uh, um, pterygoid muscle inflammation. It was not at all involved. So now I'm bringing up a little protocol based. So if I cut the sphenoid part of the artery and if it's bleeding briskly, I don't find that at all. In many many cases, only the maxilla is involved. So I mean that posterior to anterior spread, anterior to posterior spread. Sorry to tell you, uh, we will we will discuss that later about that. Yeah. We'll do it. Sir. Yeah, we'll do that. So, any other person, Dr. Urmila has raised this. Uh, uh, oh, Dr. Vikram. Dr. Vikram is there. Very nice uh, friend of mine from Bombay. Uh, you have got time? Yeah. 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 Dr. Yeah. Vikram. Yeah, I have two questions. Am I audible? Yeah, yeah, very well. 
yeah my uh, first question is uh, how do we differentiate allergic fungal rhinosinusitis invasive aspergillosis and invasive mucormycosis on ct and mri because many times even in allergic fungal we see uh, bone erosion and double density so we don't have expert uh, radiologists like dr bawa haran in in every nook and corner of the country and all ct scans we cannot discuss with him because of his busy schedule so as ent surgeons how can you know can you share some insights as to how we can ourselves differentiate because this mucor phobia is getting reported as mucor in all cases the second question is uh, we ent surgeons are very privileged to have dr janki ram teaching us uh will you uh, maybe in the near future train our radiologists have a session for our radiologists only yeah, yeah we are having we are they having don't have a janki ram but they can have a baba har yeah yeah i'll be very happy to do it and we are planning this sunday also there's going to be a radiology meet there's a national meet uh, this time and i'm giving a talk there also so we'll we'll have a discussion on that also sir uh, regarding your previous question which is about uh, ct and mr uh, i think that we discussed priorly also the ct findings of uh, allergic and acute sinusitis versus the fungal sinusitis again uh, from a radiologist point of view i'm not a pathologist to say it is mucor or aspergillus so i give it probably a fungal uh, uh, etiology or fungal sinusitis if there is going to be a bone destruction and extension anywhere then i'll give it as invasive fungal sinusitis or not this is based again on ctm i'm repeating this the hyperdensity of uh, or the double shadow sign whichever you call it that is the mucosa uh, mucosal thickening always is hypodense whereas the hyperdense fungal elements which you pick up there due to hyperemia and hemocytin deposits which you pick up as bright spots there that is uh, very important and whenever you see a bone destruction associated with particular when first of all the diagnosis of fungal sinusitis you have to make i'm not saying whether it is mucor or aspergillus because i cannot see mucor or aspergillus let's be very clear and i report it only as fungal sinusitis if it is going to be invasive i say yes there are invasions here so there can be invasive fungal sinusitis so whenever there is a bone destruction we call it as invasive fungal sinusitis it's simple to keep actually i have a point i have a point my dear uh, friend Uh, i think uh, i uh, what we did we have now in our ward a few cases of allergic fungal sinusitis as well as mucor mycosis so i asked my residents to compare these two and if you find uh, allergic fungal rhinosinusitis what happens is there is a lot of uh, material surrounded nicely by uh, uh, you know uh, sinusitis or polypoidal material so that fungus is uh, in the center but in some cases of muc i mean most cases of mucor what happens is the the uh, the the mucor is actually adherent to the bone if you look at the uh, intro picture also the blackish uh, uh, azure and things like that they are adherent to the bone and that adjacent part is uh, devoid of uh, 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 that uh, polypoidal change or something like that if it is right in the center or uh, having a thick uh, wall of polypoidal tissue most probably it is uh, this is i mean i don't Clinical. know Uh, clinically i am telling uh, i correlated it clinically and uh, found out that in mucor you have that you know uh, sticking on to the bone at one or two cuts whereas i never found that in uh, as per, uh, i don't know i mean uh, okay, i don't know clinically yeah but clinically logically that yes. is clinically that is clinically yeah thank you dr vikram uh, nice to have you so i think uh, we've had an extensive uh, lecture but we can't carry on for uh, a long time so thank you dr bawaran it was it is a real pleasure to you, uh, my, my you know uh, uh, learn learn a lot of things from you every day i keep learning some points from you and it's nice that you are you are sharing your knowledge with all our ent colleagues all over the world uh, thank you again uh, dr uh, harsha you want to conclude a lot of questions i think all these will be answered um uh, through uh, facebook uh, by dr bawaran later yeah dr vikram you have to say janagana mana and conclude is it no no i just want to request you that if you can uh, any of your fellows can make a small chart highlighting the difference between uh, afrs invasive aspergillosis and mucor mycosis in confirmed cases as a chart so that you know it becomes like a ready reckoner for us 
and you know you can label it as the royal pearl uh, no 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 this is a power and not royal no actually there are there are a few people who have already asked it and i have just asked them to make it i'll, I'll probably finish it about in a day or two and send it to dr janak yeah. yeah. so we are, we are coming out to the beautiful paper dr vikram uh, he is giving us a lot of information and uh, we will be bringing out a beautiful paper on mucor mycosis very shortly it will be published uh, we have a lot of people from you know sweden thanks lamia uh, we have people from all over the world actually uh from egypt from oman from uh, so thank you very much my dear friends it's always a pleasure to meet you sir and please, please share the link of the radiology session so that i can ask my radiologist to log in and benefit from your expertise and experience just like we do with dr dr harsha can you do that with him uh, dr harsha yes sir yeah uh, dr harsha will uh, share it who are uh, needs it will be uh, uh, oh from mongolia also dr chugu jaga oh wow that's great So thank you very much uh, my dear friends uh, have a Great happy uh, weekend thank you thank you thank you sir